I'm um, presenting Apologies for Sally, who had um, something come up rather recently and could not be here, but she is represented in, in the slides. Um, so I'm talking about East Africa, and we deliberately put East Africa in front of South Africa because a lot of the, though we're now beginning to find out about the longer record of South Africa, it has been a much shorter record in, in terms of the time span than what we've had in the East for a while. Um, but the question then arises, where exactly is East Africa? If you look at a phytogeographical region map like this one that's recently been published by the American Association of Geographers, you see that actually there is an elevated area of woodlands and savannas with a lot of altitudinal diversity that surrounds and is in the East African Rift Zone that actually has um, a great deal of similarity in, not that it doesn't have a great many different uh, terrestrial ecosystems within it, but it actually comprises a geographical zone, this, this olive green area. Um, this is an area that uh, about half of it experiences two rainy seasons a year, which makes it a much richer place. And it's also an area where the, uh, the rainfall zone is wider north to south because of the influence in part of the Indian Ocean monsoon. This area uh, has, and has had for some time, the world's largest terrestrial mammal biomass per uh, hectare or whatever. And theoretically, then, it can support the largest population of predators, among which we have to include the humans for the last uh, couple of million years, anyway. OK, and then the question is, um, what is the Middle Stone Age, which is the second part of what I'm going to talk about? And um, we could define this as a complex of stone tool industries, which span the transition from archaic humans to us. But that doesn't tell us much about how you recognize it if you're out walking around. And it's distinctive in its emphasis on hafted points and other tools that are shaped by retouch or pre-shaped on special cores. And this goes along with greater hunting competency. So we also see in the Middle Stone Age, not necessarily from the very beginning, but certainly as it continues, the first signs of symbolic behavior, including personal ornaments, engraved and painted objects and rituals, first signs of regular long distance exchange, and we also infer a, a dramatic increase in the complexity of human cognition from the technological and economic strategies that we see within developing within the Middle Stone Age. The fishing, the trapping small animals, the making of composite multi-element tools, and the expanded social networks, among other things. OK, um, this is a different paper from Blom et al., which um, I have to confess to being one of the co-authors of, which is why it's showing up so much. Um, this is, rather than showing the places from which we have environmental information, this shows us the archaeological sites in the last of Middle Stone Age affinity in the last 150,000 years. And you can see that if we, had drawn, if we had drawn this map 20 years ago, there would have been almost nothing that was dated in Eastern Africa. But uh, there would have been some sites in North Africa and a concentration of sites in South Africa. And while it's still dominated by South Africa, the other areas are filling in. When you realize, though, that Africa is more than three times the size of the United States, um, you realize that the middle of it is extremely understudied. But nevertheless, we can begin to say something. So what I want to do is very quickly go over the late Middle Stone Age since the first modern human uh, fossils attributed to Homo sapiens at about 200,000 years ago and how it relates to what we'll hear about, perhaps from the South African record, but some traits that I don't think show up in the South African record. Um, we do have beads occasionally from uh, East Africa. We have fishing from East Africa, also represented now in the South African record. Um, we have barbed bone points, however, used for fishing in uh, the this eastern zone. One of the unusual things about this record, which may not be unusual when they start looking at it more in South Africa, but we do have, from very early on, on we have long distance trade and transport of obsidian in this late time period. And we'll be looking at how far back it goes. We also have 
possible burial rituals at Herto at 160. We have complex projectile weapons at multiple sites, including geometric shapes. What's distinctive about the East African ones is the very widespread and persistent uh, existence of very small bifacial folias, which are little leaf-shaped points that resemble North American arrowheads. And we think they actually were, in all likelihood, arrowheads. And this is an example from Aduma in, uh, in Northeast Ethiopia. Um, where I worked in the 1990s. And here we have a progression from the points, the big points that are more than 100,000 years old to much smaller ones that are perhaps 90 to 80,000 years old above. And all of these points uh, the, are, tree, are uh, trimmed at the base for hafting. Um, almost all of them are, are obsidian or chert from four to eight different sources. And there are no local sources. So again, we're looking at um, long distance movement of this material. Um, the small points, we've, we've now agreed among the people who study these things that the small ones are, in fact, um, elements of a complex projectile weapon system, which if you think about it, um, if you're going to invent something like a bow and arrow, we have to accept that you're a modern human. These are some other kinds of points from Mumba in Tanzania where the Middle Stone Age goes from the bottom of the site to here. And the, the bottom's about 100, 120,000. And this is about um, 40,000 right here. And these are in this upper area at perhaps 50,000, these geometric shapes. And um, right the way through the sequence, but especially in this upper part, the, uh, this is in northern Tanzania, but the obsidian is coming from Kenya about 230 kilometers away. And um, in addition to stone points, we also have bone points. Um, these are from Katanda in the, on the western edge of this eastern zone, in the, on the edge of DR Congo, uh, dated to about 60 to 80,000 years ago and associated with the bones of very gigantic fish that's actually bigger than this one that we were catching. And there's a whole suite of these. There are three different sites that we found them at in association with Middle Stone Age artifacts. Um, there's also an, uh, possible, uh, that, a possibility that we're looking at mortuary practices in this time range. Tim White has argued that the polish on this child skull from Herto in northeast Ethiopia, dated to about 160,000 years ago, is polished. You can see these areas of polish on the back of the skull here. And it's polished from somebody holding onto it and rubbing it when it was already a skull. And then he argued that this could be part of, of a kind of mortuary ritual. We also have, we very rarely have personal ornaments in East Africa because most of the sites are in open air uh, locations where the organic preservation is very bad. So if they're not making um, beads out of stone, which we don't think anybody in Africa seems to have done, then uh, we're not going to recover the beads. But where we do have caves, it's interesting that in three of the very small number of caves that we have in Africa, we have um, probable evidence of beads. So this is Nkapane Yamuto in Highland, Kenya, about 50,000 years ago. And we have not only ostrich egg shell beads, but the manufacture of ostrich egg shell beads, along with these very large geometric forms. And also, once these geometric forms come in, they stay. It keeps developing in that direction into the later Stone Age. We don't see a, a disappearance of these geometric forms and then their reappearance later. Okay, these are ostrich eggshell beads from Mumba, again towards the top of the sequence, but I was able to date one of these by amino acid racemization to 52,000 years ago. And there's recently been a similar date in the um, very early 40,000s for such a bead. Um, and then these are from Porcupeak Cave in Ethiopia, dated to 33 to 60. The argument here is not necessarily that these are man-made or anthropo anthropogenic perforations, but that the distribution of these opercula in the complete absence of, of the rest of the shell suggests human agency in some way. These are, were, collect, were collected and described by Zalala Masafa and colleagues. Um, so what about before Homo sapiens and the early Middle Stone Age? What, if we go back, if all of this is characteristic of the last 200,000 years ago, 
what do we know about the development of this and what happened before this? So before this, what we have evidence from, and I've put in red what we have in, in Africa that is not, I think, shared with Neanderthals. Because when we go back, if we're going back into the past, we're going back to the uh, last common ancestor period that uh, Chris just put up, um, into the divergence time he just put up. So we have to think, well, if the Middle Stone Age turns out to begin 400,000 years ago, did the Neanderthals leave Africa with the Middle Stone Age? So it turns out that Neanderthals share some of these features, although the interesting thing is they share them quite a lot later. So we have to wonder if there was another out of Africa, if there was a, an exodus of Homo heidelbergensis out of Africa, and then another exodus with some of these cultural features that we're not catching in the fossils. So what we have are these, um, these very sophisticated technologies for making shapes on the core, for taking a core, shaping that core into a particular way, which is very complex and has to, and has to be learned. And it does imply sophisticated sequential action and conceptualization. There are a lot of stages in making this that don't seem to be leading towards the final product unless you uh, can really carefully imitate somebody teaching it to you. And we see these by 500,000 years ago. So that's really the beginning. And it may begin um, before that in the context of the final Acheulean. Then we see these long distance procurement networks I've, also me I've already mentioned. Um, and they're procuring the raw material, not just the finished pieces, which is another difference. We also see these hafted weapons very early on. We also see large quantities of ochre, kilograms of ochre in sites processed into powder. But what we don't see are ornaments, engravings, or burials with grave goods. So there are some differences with the later period. Um, this is, the, the, again, this graph that we published in 2000. And just to, sh to put some of this other, here are the, the fossils. We had an end date of 280,000 years ago, because we thought at the time that was the beginning of the Middle Stone Age. Um, but since then, we ourselves have proved that this was incorrect. We do have these things appearing and disappearing. But what the red lines show is how far back these things now extend to considerably before 280,000 years ago in many cases. So um, what we just a picture of what these prepared cores involve, that this allows that these allow the production of very thin flakes and points which are shaped on the core. And these, this technology appears in Africa just before or at the same time as the first specimens of Homo heidelbergensis um, about 650,000 years ago. It's a very abstract idea to go from a lump of stone, not to the finished piece, but to the core that is then pre-designed to knock off one of these special flakes. This is a pre-shaped Lavella point from a Lorgasali, just to show you a real one. OK, I'm going to also talk about Sally's material. She has sent some slides and text to go with it. Um, this is her work in, the, in northern Kenya in the Capturan Formation where uh, a lot of the material is under a tuff dated to 285,000 years ago. This is one of our advantages in East Africa, that we do have a lot of volcanics, which can be dated by argon-argon to a very precise degree. Um, and here she has a series of blades, which have been published, um, which are older than 285. And again, this is something that Neanderthals eventually did. Um, but she also has even older blades and um, cores designed to produce blades from before 500,000 years ago. So um, the idea of producing these very standardized products on a single core, again, is something very complicated that we don't see earlier. The transition from the Acheulean to the Middle Stone Age involves significant changes in, in stone toolkits. Eventually, they give up the hand axes, and they start producing points. These are parts of composite tools. You need to make a hafting material and system, which could involve binding, could involve glue. You, it takes a long time to make a haft that you, you uh, tie them to. You can't just take any old stick, or it's not going to fly straight. Spears, and then when you break it, you need to work, figure out some way to fix it, to repair it. Um, spears are lighter and more portable than hand axes. 
And um, ethnographic analyses suggest that stone-tipped weapons are particularly effective for large mammals. So where do we have some of these points? This is a very early sequence from Gadamata in Ethiopia where we have some very small points like this one or this one that are trimmed at the base for hafting. Here's another one trimmed all the way around. This very flat invasive working into a perfect symmetrical shape is characteristic of the East African material. We also have these blade-like forms but very small with uh, retouched bases as well. We don't quite understand what those are for. And all this is, at, uh, most of this is at least 285,000 years ago. This is Sally's material from the Capturin, and this is under a tuff dated to 230, series of tufts, 235 to 284, um, with more than 2,000 artifacts in situ under this tuff. Um, some of the artifacts are points like this, and they're made of obsidian, and the obsidian, there are also Lavalwa points, which are shaped on the core which are very thin and symmetrical and straight. And um, the thing about the obsidian is you can trace where it comes from. And Stanley Ambrose has been involved in a lot of the tracing for both Sally's work and our work at Alorga Sally. And the, there were little chips that fit back onto these points and he was able to take the little chips and figure out where the source was. So the, and in this case, the points, the basic point may have been uh, shaped elsewhere and then ref refined or finished at the site. Where, did, where is the elsewhere? Um, at least a couple of sources, one of which is 130 kilometers away. So again, very long distances that this material is traveling. Okay, at Alorga Sile, and you've heard something about this, this is uh, sites in, an, in a locality that we just call B with a tuff running through it that is dated uh, variously to 305 to 312. And underneath this tuff, we have Lavalwa flakes, we have coloring material, um, we have um, disc various kinds of cores. And at this site, um, BOK2, which is under, as you see, it's under the two tufts, 305 and 313 here in the wall. All of these little black spots, there are multiple occupations here, and all these little black spots are obsidian. In fact, 55% of the plotted artifacts are obsidian. Um, here, here they are. And um, the uh, lithics include um, shaped points, Lavalwa points, and a whole series of small scrapers. We also have bladelets and biconical bladelet cores. Um, although these are not the bladelets we have in the late Stone Age, it's nonetheless an emphasis on a very small tool type. And we also have the cores. We have Lavalwa cores. We have that point that Rick showed you and that I'm showing you actually fits back onto a Lavalwa core. So it isn't just the finished artifacts. It's the whole shebang. So where is it coming from? We have, here's a Lorgasali, a scale of 120 kilometers. Um, we have multiple sources again, and some of them are 40 kilometers, some of them are 60, and um, there's coming from at least four different directions. And that's, we still have 40% of the samples we've looked at that we don't know where the source is. So there's a great diversity in uh, where the material is coming from and a great deal of the material at the site. So um, the local raw materials are mostly quartzites and quartz in many of these East African sites, including Aduma, including Lorgasali, including uh, the Capturin, but the points are preferentially made on very fine grained materials which have to be uh, brought from far away. So what's the implication of this far away transport of material? If it's a large home range, you have to know a lot about the environment and you're going to meet a lot of individuals. You're going to meet people from different groups going to these sources. And you need some way to identify yourself as a friend. So it's not surprising that pigment goes along with this. And it may be that they're trading with these other groups and that this wide network of relationships provides a way to deal with climate variability, to buffer you against environmental risks. OK, pigment. This is the last topic. Um, this is from the Capturin, a grindstone with ground fragments of ochre. This is from a Lorgasile with a, a lump of what we now think is an iron-rich mineral which has been ground on one side to release a powder. And this is a close-up seeing the grinding striations here from it. 
And this is from Twin River, Zambia, just so that we get central, the, the southern part of this area in here. And here there are many kilos of ochre, more than six kilos, um, in these little pieces that are many of which have been ground. So um, in conclusion, the, the sort of take home message is that there is a gradual transition to us that begins at least 500,000 years ago. And by the time we get to 200,000, 160,000 years ago, and people are beginning, um, particularly let's say by 100,000 years ago, to make complex projectile weapon systems, we're probably, and to conduct mortuary rituals, we probably are very much dealing with us. So thank you.